Okay. We're here. We're glad to be here. You all awesome. Look you Hi, all three. Look Hi, David. Okay. David Barquist. How is David Barquist? Which is a fabulous piece of Victorian furniture behind, or no, frame <laughs> things. I feel like I have a bunch of friends now. Yay. <laughs> Oh, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. And we have friends. We have 56 people so far, which is great. Wow. Hello, John Vick. Hello, John Vick. Beth McLaughlin. <clears throat> Ferguson, look, with his bellows. He's got his bellows collection. Hi, I'm Sally Newman. I'm one of the weekday guides. Oh, hi, Sally. Hi. Thank hi, you I'm for... Cheryl. <laughs> I'm an associate. At the Clay Studio. Hi, Cheryl. At the Clay Studio. Hi. Cheryl. Josie. Hi, Helen. <clears throat> and I'm Renee, a guide. At the Hello, welcome. Can you hear Joan Johnson? Hi, Joan. I, I can okay. Can you hear me, Jennifer? It's Janet Samuel. Hi, Janet. I, I can hear you. Hi. Okay. Hi. Thanks for coming. Wouldn't miss it. Any, anyone else want to say hi and share a moment of joy? Hi, Helen. Hello. I can't get my picture up, but I guess it'll come soon. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer. It's Judy. Oh, can you hear me? Hi, Judy. We can. Okay. Why doesn't the picture come up? Uh, my hair looks so terrific. You might have your video turned off. Okay. Yeah. And if there's a little red line through the. Uh, ah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Okay. So um, I just wanted to. Oh, we have 70 people. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, and say thank you for coming. Just a point of order. First few minutes right now, we're just saying hi. Once we get started, I'm just gonna ask everyone to put themselves on mute. Not, you don't have to mute your video. We like to see um, your smiling faces. It's mostly just because of feedback um, that gets a little bit complicated and any kind of background noise. If you have a question or wanna say something, please put it in the chat if you can, or there's a little, there's a way to raise your hand. Um, Gosh, let's see if you, I don't even know how to do that because I've never had to. But anyway, um, if you have never been on a Zoom before, if you go to the top right of your screen, it should say speaker view or gallery view. So if you want to see everybody in little squares, click gallery view. If you want to see the person who's talking biggest, hit speaker view. We're going to be sharing our screen so that you can see a PowerPoint with some images in a bit. So. Um, most of your view of people will kind of go away for that period of time. If you put questions or comments in the chat, I'll keep an eye on that. It may be that it's towards the end that we take questions, but if I happen to look over and I can um, manage it, I'll in call out on you in, in the midst of the talk. If we do that, you're welcome to take yourself off of mute and um, verbally ask your question or just respond. And then at the end, we can do again, sort of everyone take themselves off mute so that we can all kind of say hello and share a few moments together. Um, Jennifer, the hand is in the list, at the bottom of the list of participants. So my hands, it, it says lower or raise hand. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Zoe. Um, not that we can't do this, but you know. That's true. I just might not notice right away. Um, yeah, it'll come up in my list of participants with your, there's, Zoe has raised your hand, so then I can see that for later and you'll get moved to the top. Um, we, let's see, what else did I want to tell you that, um, yeah, so that's great. Okay, so we are going to get started. <laughs> Welcome to our fifth Lunch and Learn from the Clay Studio. We're so pleased that so many people wanted to join us today and have been joining us. This is now a weekly series and will probably continue even after we go back, dare I say, go back or restart some kind of um, in-person life as well. 
because it's a really fun opportunity for people from all over the place to get together, which we really never had before. So here's one of the little highlights uh, amidst the strange situation that we are in. Um, I just want to also let you know that we have virtual classes at the Clay Studio that are happening. Um, there are some free things as well as some paid really wonderful interactions with teachers. We have um, on Fridays at two o'clock our colleague Shannon Jones does a really fun YouTube live session with all kinds of trivia and just conversation which is nice. We have our YouTube channel has become quite robust and is populated with lots of how-to videos for kids and, and adults. So please do check that out. We are really so pleased today to welcome Roberto Lugo, Elizabeth Agro, and Jack Hinton to have this conversation with us. And it was prompted by the fact that there is currently an exhibition or an installation at the art museum juxtaposing Roberto's all about the Benjamins piece with Udon's bust of Benjamin Franklin. So we invited Jack and Elizabeth, who are the curators who made that happen within the museum. And of course, Rob to talk about his inspiration. So we'll talk a little bit about that within the first section of the conversation. And then towards the end, we'll talk directly to Rob about his experience. He just had an opportunity to be in Rome. He won the Rome Prize, quite prestigious, and was there for, um, we'll talk about it later, but maybe a month or so before he and his family had to come home because of all that is happening. So without further ado, I'll just give you a little background. Elizabeth Agro is the Nancy M. McNeil Curator of American Modern and Contemporary Crafts and Decorative Arts at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She is co-founder and advisor of Critical Craft Forum, an online platform for dialogue and exchange. She is also a member of the Clay Studios Collections Committee and was a partner on our 2019 exhibition from storage to studio, as was Jack Hinton. Jack is an associate curator of European decorative arts and sculpture at the museum. He's a specialist in Renaissance decorative arts. His responsibilities in the department range from medieval art and architecture to the early modern period. With his colleagues, Melissa Megan and the late Andrew Lenz, Jack wrote a book published by PMA on Udon's Portraits of Franklin, another great reason why he's here with us today, titled Encountering Genius, Udon's Portraits of Benjamin Franklin. Jack has recently been working on an exhibition by the contemporary designers Ronan and Erwin Borlek. Jack, say that better. There you go, thanks. Um, and on a book entitled Renaissance Treasures, about the medieval and renaissance masterpieces acquired by the museum in 1930. And um, he also wrote a book, among others, The Art of German Stoneware, 1300 to 1900, the Charles Nichols collection at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So we have often collaborated on the encounters between historical and contemporary ceramics. And then Roberto Lugo is an American artist, ceramicist, social activist, poet, and educator. He is a professor of ceramics at Tyler School of Art. Lugo uses porcelain as his medium of choice, illuminating its aristocratic surface with imagery of pottery, poverty, inequality, social and racial injustice. Lugo's works are multicultural mashups, traditional European and Asian porcelain forms and techniques reimagined with a 21st century street sensibility. Lugo is the recipient of the 2019 Rome Prize and was awarded a Pew Fellowship also in 2019. His work is represented in the permanent collections of the Los Angeles County Museum, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the High Museum, Brooklyn Museum, the Walters Museum, and more. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm just gonna go ahead and put everyone on mute and then unmute our speakers. Unmute myself, I suppose. Can to unmute you, Lugo. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm now going to share my screen. So that everybody can get a look at the great work that is on view at the museum. All right, can everybody see that? <laughs> Great. 
Okay, so basically we wanted to um, ask Elizabeth and Jack to talk about the piece. So Elizabeth's going to talk a little bit about acquiring the piece for the museum's collection and then she and Jack can talk about um, deciding about how to put it in the gallery and then um, Jack can talk about the udon in relation to Rob's piece. So take it away Elizabeth and Jack. So good afternoon everyone. It, it's really wonderful to um, to be to have this opportunity to be live and talking about art and being in we can't be in front of the actual piece but virtually I'll take it at this point um, being mid almost mid-May and having been out of our hallowed halls for so many weeks um, it's really beautiful to be able to come into your home and your space and you to come into mine um, so uh, I really thanks the clay studio and Jen for giving us this opportunity so let's all get our Lugo on and I'm gonna put my hat on to just be in the <laughs> Love it. Uh, circa 1970. Thank you, Uncle Joe. May he rest in peace. Um, doesn't fit very well, but just for you, Roberto. And I must have been really gearing up for this because, um, you know, between the varied projects I'm working on, you know, I'm sure, like many of you out there, um, having wicked, wicked dreams. And Roberto, you were in mine last night, and, and it's, it's clean, don't worry. But, uh, you and I have completed this opportunity with my Korea project, and you and I were on a plane, arrived in Seoul, and we were going to go to a workshop, Roberto, to learn about uh, Celadon and how to do the crane inlay on Korean, um, you know, the, the, the wonderful ceramics that the Koreans make. Um, and I, we were on our way. I, I, we were in Korea, we had a meal, of course, gotta have a meal, and then we're off to the potters down the peninsula, you and I. That was that what I was really, up to this morning. That's so, really specific. Yes, it was really, <laughs> my very, lots of specificity these days, so. That's, that's um, a vivid, vivid dream, I must say. Yeah, extremely vivid, and the fact that I remember it is, I don't know, good, scary, I don't know, I'll leave that to you. Anyone a psychologist out there? Call me. Oh no. <laughs> Put it in the chat. Sounds like, a, sounds like a future trip waiting to happen. Yeah, I like that idea. I'm, <laughs> so um, back to all about the Benjamin. So um, this really uh, very important pot uh, was on view at Wexler Gallery in the summer of 2016. Um, you had given a talk at the Clay Studio, which I also heard, and it was the First time I had heard you speak um, in person, and um, you know, I there was a there was like a rumbling out there about you and your work. It was a very important moment in your career, um, and I went to see what all the fuss was about. And you know, I was really taken with your spoken word. Um, you really uh, resonated with me as a human being first, and secondly as a curator. Um, I love the fact that. This is a, a potter who is looking uh, to the past, but very much making it about the present and very much, um, you know, understanding his ceramic history, but also very much living uh, in his own uh, shoes, making, walking in his own walk and um, really using ceramic history in the way of, of sending a message, which Jack will speak to later, but uh, anyone who's a decorative art historian knows that ceramics have always uh, stood the test of time um, to speak to politics and also to to um, celebrate important figures or political events or war uh, historic war um, moments of war or or whatever it's their commentaries their their social pieces their political pieces um, and they're very powerful and Roberto you have uh, brought that back to the pot the ceramic the the humble pot um, in a very contemporary way, but also very much um, in an important way in, in speaking your truth. Um, so All About the Benjamins um, was an important acquisition. We were the first museum to buy your work, um, and I'm very proud to have that as part of my CV, um, to know that, that this was, uh, that you were going somewhere with your work that it needed to be seen by many people. Um, and so, uh, it was such a privilege to, to purchase it. It references a very important pot by Carl Mueller, the century vases that were ma manufactured in 1876 um, through the Union Porcelain Works in Brooklyn, but exhibited at the 1876 Biennale um, here in Philadelphia. Um, that pot, the century vases, were celebrating 
the centennial and celebrating America's progress. Um, and of course, this was a, a, a privileged progress and, and one half of the story. Um, I love how you bookend it with, the, with other stories and truths that need to be said. Um, but the fact that you are appropriating this form, but, but in a very positive way and um, making it and, and doing a series like the Century Bosses were originally in their decorative art program and celebrating different things. Um, this pot specifically has uh, you uh, counterposed with Benjamin Franklin. And as you told me at the time of acquisition, um, in my planning and preparation for the acquisition, that you saw yourselves as two Philly boys. And I love that. I love that, that you can take hold of Benjamin and make him yours, um, right. make him your boy. <laughs> um, and I, I love that aspect. Um, I love the fact that I had to bone up and learn more about rap from the 80s and 90s, of which I remember well, but <laughs> like, you know, knew that they were songs and listened to them, but didn't necessarily identify that wasn't, you know, I was into grunge and also um, uh, other, you know, like Ozzy Osbourne, believe it or not. And so it wasn't my okay. genre, but um, it was <laughs> kind of funny to go before my committee and Joan Johnson might remember because she's out there. Um, and like spool off all the names of these rap groups and the songs as this very diminutive middle-aged white woman. It was pretty funny. Um, I laughed at myself inside and uh, I, would, I would have loved to have you in the room because I think you would have gotten a big kick out of me. Um, yeah. But more importantly, I think that um, the idea of getting it on view has always been paramount and um, trying to find right juxtapositions. And the museum has worked really hard to sort of think about how we can look at the past uh, through the lens of contemporary. And um, through a committee at the museum, trying to push that effort also to, um, to bring other voices into the museum collection and get them on view. Um, and I, I thank our African-American working art group and um, also uh, the leadership of John Vick to bring us together to talk about, let's do it, let's get these objects on view. And I have to say, I have to shout out to him to credit him with this juxtaposition, which then brought me to Jack Hinton to say, can we, can we get this on view? Now, Jack and I have worked in the past together to get contemporary works on view in his galleries. He's been extremely generous and a wonderful colleague. And so for Jack, it was really a no brainer to say yes, um, he's open to those sorts of things. And, um, and I'll just let Jack speak to that part of the conversation, Jack. Well, well, of, well of course, you know, and I think it's, it's always um, exciting for a curator of more historic material as, you know, I think I have to count myself in that, in that group to have works of art from artists in the present day that can speak to you know concerns perhaps that, that, that can connect with historic works or the, that can give us a fresh eye you know and looking at something from a few hundred years ago and you know three or four years ago and find connections and you know allow our visitors and the people looking at these works of art to make discoveries so so from that point of view you know it's it's a very worthy and wonderful thing and a great opportunity to be able to to, to do it um and I might just add go, that um, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Jen and, and the Clay Love studio. You too, baby. I'll see you guys later. Thank um, you. See you later. How you doing? All right, you? For inviting yeah, me. Yeah, it's already in the car. Hold on, guys. One sec. Uh, okay, go ahead, Jack. Just keep talking. Um, yeah, just for inviting us to, to have the opportunity to, to, to speak today with Roberto, you know, about the work and about the steps to position. And um, also, I must say, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for me to not only get together with, with, with friends and colleagues, um, is to wear a shirt, you know, and, and feel a bit a little bit more formal <laughs> because it's been, it's been a couple of months, you know, sort of wearing like ugly, ugly sweaters and, uh, and T-shirts. So it's a, you know, it's a nice moment to feel maybe a little bit kind of back in the game. Um, so I think, do, do we have a video of the oh, yeah. installation? Is this? I think that might be it. I think that's the video, yeah. Um, oops, hold on one second. Maybe click on the bottom left, maybe. Oh, 
I know there's like a little, hold on. So I was very lucky. Um, let's see. Hopefully we have some video here. I was very lucky that as we were installing it, I decided to do a video clip to send to Roberto because he didn't even know we were doing this. And, um, and so now in this COVID moment, it was really great to have that on my phone. So hopefully we can pull this up. Should be in this slide. I know it is. It, that's the video. I don't know why it doesn't want to play. Er, sorry. Okay. Well, we'll figure this out as we go along. But why don't we talk about who Don? <laughs> well, sure. We can, we, and we can describe it. So, what, so what you would see if we were able to be in the museum uh, right now is the um, rotunda gallery there. So we see sort of three eighty eight, <clears throat> and then if Jen, you move to the to the next image. And um, so, so the Franklin um, by Jean Antoine Houdon is in the is in the centre of that space, and the Rotunda Gallery is something that was designed by the museum's director Fisk Kimball, the you know this this great figure in the museum's history, who helped to bring about the sort of series of historic interiors on what was the, what was the historic second floor is now the third floor of historic rooms and spaces um, that, that convey sort of an atmosphere and environment for the works of art shown there. And the rotunda is a neoclassical space and it, it recalls the kinds of um, uh, galleries constructed in great English country houses for the display of, of classical sculpture or, or perhaps even because it's a, it's a domed sort of coffered space, there's some um, little kind of nod perhaps to uh, spaces like the, the Pantheon in Rome, you know, these, 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 these great halls, it's not as big as the Pantheon, these great halls, you know, where the, the sculptures of, of, of the greats, you know, could, could be displayed. And so, you know, when this um, gallery even first opened in 1928, it was used to show sculptures by Jean-Antoine Houdon of the great figures of uh, the American War of Independence, the American Revolution. And so there was a standing uh, sculpture, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about a bit more, of George Washington, a very famous work by, by Udon, which was in the center of the space. That's a bronze cast that's now actually in Washington Square. If anyone's sort of able to, to take a, a, you know, a, a, a bit of a perambulation outside, um, you could see it still, but that, that was there. So really you know, that space then was, was all about kind of celebrating these, these great figures of American history from a certain perspective. Um, and of course, you know, the museum, then I suppose would, would find the display of the Franklin there rather rather kind of perfect, although we only acquired this bust in uh, 1996, you know, as it goes. But um, if, if we see the next images of the, um, so you see this great juxtaposition here of the Franklin with the, with the Lugo and the Lugo in the space beyond. There's some incredibly pink tapestries, um, very beautiful things. I don't know if we have some views of the, of the Franklin bust itself as well. Yeah, so you see, so, so the bust is, you know, it's a really remarkable work of sculpture. It's this amazing sort of work of, of naturalism that, that really shows Udon's abilities uh, as, you know, a, as a great portraitist. Um, it has this amazing sort of malleable quality to the flesh. You know, this great sort of transformation of hard stone into something that seems soft and supple. And that also, you know, if you, if you think about, well, Here's an interesting thing, you know, well, what, is a, what does a portrait mean? You know, what, what, do, what does an artist want us to take from a portrait? What does the sitter want us to take from a portrait? And what do we bring to the table? And that, I think, is an interesting kind of conversation that hopefully we can talk about a bit more. But in this case, you know, the interpretation has often been how perfectly it, it seems to capture Franklin in a moment, in a moment as if of, 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 of deep thought, um, of enlightened thought of how perhaps he's, he's just about to speak, he's just about to open his mouth, this sort of moment of poise of issuing wisdom. And the irony, of course, is that he was known for being fairly taciturn, for not really speaking very much, unless he had something worth saying. And it also represents Franklin in a relatively humble way, you know, with, his, with his plain suits, his uncovered hair, which when Franklin you know, came to France in 1776, seeking support from France for the you know, American cause was really remarked upon. You know, he, was a, a quasi, he wasn't an official ambassador, but he was a quasi ambassador, but he, he was dressed in this much more natural way, 
which lived up to what French expectations of what an American, this sort of great natural philosopher would be. And I think also starts to tell us something about well, the, the power of imagery and self-representation and meanings in, in portraiture um, and, and what this can all be about, sort of the power of images. And so, you know, in, in having Roberto's piece, you know, with uh, the Franklin bust, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a literal juxtaposition of saying, oh, well, you know, here's a Franklin and here's, here's another Franklin, but we can start to think about, well, the, the idea of, of, of the portrait, of this kind of imagery, ideas about self-representation, about propaganda, about, about meaning and symbolism, they're all kind of packed into these, into these two works you know, as we encounter them. Um, you know, for the, for the Udon bust, you know, one of the important things obviously is to understand that the, I mean, Franklin was a, was a celebrity, you know, when he came to France in 1776, he was very famous for his experiments in electricity, a hugely celebrated figure. Um, so he understood, I think, the power of, of images and images of himself and how, you know, as being portrayed as a celebrated figure, could increase sympathy and interest in the American cause. So there's a propagandistic kind of aspect to his encounters with portraitists, really from the 1777, when, he, when he's there, right away. And, and we know about images circulating you know, very quickly. It's being the, it was being the great sort of New Year's gift of 1777 was to have a print of, of Franklin. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's how that, that image perhaps, or how the image of, of this figure could drive engagement and, and support. Um, so he knew it was important. And then, you know, for, um, for Udon, you know, representing Franklin also became important to him professionally. So, you know, for his success as an artist and as a portraitist, you know, th there's, there's a lot going on here as well. So even the sort of the artist's relationship to Franklin, well, there's, there's Udon in the studio. So the artist's relationship to, to Franklin is, is an interesting one as well. So here we see a painting by um, Louis Leopold Boy, who's a French painter from 1804. So this is really at the pinnacle of Udon's you know, success as a, as a sculptor. Um, you see him in his studio, he's with his wife and children. He's making a portrait of this mathematician and astronomer called um, Laplace. You see ranged around him in the shelves above, you know, all the different busts, all these, all these different uh, figures, many of these are royals, Voltaire's up there, all the great philosophers of the day, or Voltaire's behind his head, actually. Um, all the great figures of the day, you know, that he was able to portray. And, you know, clearly it's, it's not a one-way street, right? He's, he's portraying these people, you know, not only because they're great figures, but also because it, you know, can add to his own fame and success as an artist. And one of the things that Udon was able to exploit as uh, a portraitist was technologies allowing him to, to um, reproduce in some numbers, you know, busts in plaster and in terracotta or in plaster tinted to look like clay, to look like terracotta, um, you know, in order to sell them. And he also exploited the possibility of having public exhibitions in his studio, of bringing people in to see his latest works as well. So he really kind of understood, I think, the, 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 the dynamics of the market and of marketing, you know, really trying to be kind of up on, on the latest kinds of trends. So um, you see here, you know, the, I mean, this obviously didn't quite happen like this, but the idea anyway of the artist kind of portraying, you know, the person in front of him working the, the raw clay bust, you know, to, to turn out this portrait, perhaps this sort of idealized image of, sort of how we don't work. One of the funny connections I wanted to, to talk about, though, is, you know, when we talked about this yesterday, is that on, on Roberto's point, you know, we see uh, Franklin with a, with a bandana. And we were discussing this as an image for sort of social, social distancing and, and having, having a face covering, which isn't original meaning, but it's, it was obviously prescient. Um, one of the interesting things about the, the Franklin bust is that you know, Franklin was, was so much in demand and had already sat for another artist, uh, a sculptor, Jean-Jacques Caffieri, in 1777, who was notoriously difficult and quite unpleasant, in fact. Um, and he sent some rather nasty letters to, to Franklin and Temple Franklin after this happened. But there's a sense, perhaps, that, you know, Franklin didn't like to sit for artists terribly much after he'd been portrayed a number of times. And also that for Udon, you know, getting access to this figure perhaps wasn't totally straightforward. And one of the interpretations um, that's, you know, historically um, been made with this bust is that we're not sure whether Udon had direct access to Franklin to sculpt this bust, whether he actually sat for him at all, 
or if Udon basically had to kind of do a guerrilla style, you know, observation of his subject at a distance of, I mean, some of the public events that Franklin attended in, in Paris in 77, 78, um, or even at the meetings of the same Masonic Lodge. And, and we think it's because in 1783, Udon writes a letter to an unknown recipient saying, thank you very much for presenting me to Dr. Franklin. And it's, it's an odd thing to say if you, if you weren't already kind of familiar with it, and that anyway has led to a lot of different kinds of interpretations. But the idea here, you know, of, of this artist, this great sculptor, this great portraitist being able to create something like this without having met uh, his subject is really kind of wild, but also, very interesting example, I would argue, of uh, artists um, practicing social distancing uh, with their with their subjects. So funnily enough, so trying to kind of keep it um, on topic a little bit. But Udon, you know, when he received, so so we're talking about the visiting Rome and the Rome Prize. So Udon was an early recipient in 1761 when he was about 20 of the Prix de Rome, which is this great prize for French artists to go to Rome and to study. And Udon during this period had a couple of important commissions to make sculpture, one of John the Baptist, and he wrote about how he found a hermit, the perfect hermit, to represent John the Baptist, who didn't want to pose for him either. And so Udon basically stalked his, stalked this hermit, somehow, maybe stuck his head in the cave, and, um, you know, when then went back to his studio and worked the, the raw clay, you know, into his desired um, image. So this idea of you know trying to sort of sculpt people kind of remotely, I think, is a, is a really interesting uh, topic that, that that we can come back to. But but for Udon, you know, portraying Franklin was so important because it, it established his fame and also helped to establish his reputation as the sculptor of the figures of American independence. So if we just close with the with the Washington, so the so the great um, commission, you know, that that Udon eventually received more of this was to make the standing figure of Washington. It's in the state capital in Richmond in, in Virginia. Um, and Udon came to Philadelphia and to the US in 1785 with Franklin, obviously friends at that point, um, in order to you know, realize casts of Washington's face to, to, to make this great work. And you know, so you can see, I think, from, from that interaction, from this portrayal of Franklin, who, who, um, Udon also made portraits of Jefferson and John Paul Jones and, and others, how you know, he was able to establish you know, his uh, artistic success, you know, his, his own kind of commercial sort of success from, from this interaction. So in a very funny way, and if we want to kind of think about connections between um, portrayals of Franklin's of now and then, you know, these connections through the centuries, you know, for Udon, Franklin was a symbol of of monetary, of, of financial and artistic success. And I think, you know, it's, it would be a mistake for us to, to, to not consider, you know, we, we get very tied up with the fine arts, to not consider, you know, the importance of commerce, of, you know, being, being financially successful for artists, you know, throughout time and how that's actually a motivating factor um, for so many things. Anyway, I've, I've talked probably far too much, but one thing I really wanted to ask uh, Roberto, actually, is how, how do you feel? about this juxtaposition and, and maybe you could, could tell us what, what you think about it. Um, well, um, I mean, it's very humbling and, and obviously an honor to be in, in the PMA. Um, honestly, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it feels vulnerable uh, at times because as, uh, you know, as a, as a craft artist um, and somebody working in ceramic, I mean, my approach, uh, my approach to uh, mark making and uh, the creation of form is, um, in many ways, very um, different than a lot of the work that's in the gallery. Um, in terms of uh, you know likeness, um, you know uh, how much time someone would would you know spend trying to you know get something to look exactly like a human. Um, <clears throat> You know that they're that they're creating a portrait of. Uh, for me, uh, my approach—I should speak to the time where I, I was making this. My approach was um, very much to speak to a broad audience with the content that I'm trying to relay, and a lot of it has to do with bringing um, different uh, aspects of, of, of uh, parts of culture and society together. So for me, growing up in um, Kensington and Philadelphia and really being surrounded by hip hop and graffiti. Those are the two art forms that I was mostly um, 
you know, aware of and that I grew up with that and the mural arts. And so, you know, the graffiti comes into a question with, um, uh, with the mark making um, that I'm making sort of gestural portraits, gestural graffiti, and even the way that I, I apply ornamentation um, in many ways is sort of like tagging. Um, and then we have uh, the portraits that come from uh, mural arts and being in Philly and seeing portrait murals um, everywhere. And also thinking a bit about, you know, historically um, just a few things that really inspire me um, in terms of the visual arts is, uh, is the portrait, is the figure, um, you know, seeing that. And also I feel like I'm in many ways just continuing a tradition that has already been done. Um, you know, if we look at ancient Greek pottery, if we look at, um, you know, cultures uh, that, you know, we see a lot of uh, ceramics in, in um, anthropology museums. And the reason why is because it tells us a lot about what was happening. Um, and so for me, going into making a pot, I really kind of was following the same approach, which is to talk about what was what's happening and to represent my culture um, within this, this context. And so what's really interesting is even though this is representative of that centennial vase, it's also really vastly different in terms of the approach um, and uh, you know the figures uh, that are put on the side of it and um, the form and even the color scheme. And so even though whenever I have made a century vase, my approach to it is completely different with this particular one what I was really wanting to do was was represent and and, um, and uh, figure out how to intertwine hip hop culture with the the decorative arts. Uh, me seeing those as both two things that I really love, and two things that don't necessarily have to be opposites or um, belonging to two different people. I think where we're at right now in society, we're seeing um, more people of, of really diverse backgrounds have an interest in something like craft and craft history. And so why not try to figure out how to represent those things? And so um, a few of the songs that are listed on here, um, I don't usually make a habit of putting song lyrics on, on pottery, but um, uh, this, the original starting point was all about the Benjamins. And I think one of the reasons why I chose that song as well, um, sort of that, that phrase where that comes from, but just because of the fact that, you know, when I look at Benjamin Franklin growing up, I looked at him as a very different figure. I associated Ben Franklin with, with money, you know, so whenever I saw, you know, or I mean, I didn't really get to see money hundreds growing up. It was sort of like I, I identified it with that. Right. And so um, that's a relationship that I think a lot of folks who come from where I come from have with Ben Franklin. And then as I started to go to college and and um, sort of see this era that I became really obsessed with, which is sort of like late um, 18th century, um, you know, early um, sort of Americana. Um, I began to start to, um, I began to start to sort of like look at that figure in, in, a, in a different way. And so um, it's interesting to see the bandana on Ben Franklin, just because I, I think having that bandana over your face, I mean, nowadays we have a different context for it, right? But having that bandana over your face sort of gives you a, a bit of street cred or can, can kind of make it look like you're going to rob somebody or be involved in a gang. And I really wanted that for him because for me, just having a bandana around my head looks, look, looks like that, even if I don't have it around my mouth. Um, you know, so I kind of wanted to be able to figure out ways to um, create connections between Ben Franklin and I. Um, Someone asked me about the, the handles that are on the sides, the, the panda and the goat. And so originally um, on the Centennial vase, the original had um, buffalo heads, two buffalo heads on the side of it. And those were, um, and they also had animals lining the bottom of it, sort of three quarters of the way down or, or one quarter of the way down. And those were all animals that were indigenous to the United States. Um, and so for me, thinking about what I wanted to represent, I, I already started with this form that connected with the Centennial Vaz. I was talking about Philadelphia, which had this really direct connection with it being um, exhibited at the World's Fair in, um, in 1876. And, um, and also where it was made, you know, and, uh, you know in terms of um, Trent Porcelain Works. Is that, is that the name of it, Trent? Uh, I remember Union, it being Union, 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 Union Porcelain Works. Yeah. yeah. 
And so sort of all these connections that are starting to come out and start, I, I was able to look at, um, you know, I was still really into Sav porcelain and sort of the, the goat that's used there on the sides of these vases is representative of masculinity, but, um, uh, or, or virility, I should say. The thing that I was really um, taken aback by the, 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 the goat was that these, these gold horns in this beard for me represented uh, wealth. And so it just like reminded me of what I thought of when I thought of Ben Franklin. And so I wanted something really, really raw there. And the panda um, is, I often use as a sort of, um, I don't know, post post expressionist, uh, you know, stand in for me. So, um, you know, panda being sort of uses like a, um, an animal iteration of me. So there's this back and forth between Ben Franklin and I, and, and I'm trying to think of that throughout the pot, whether it's the graffiti or the ornamentation I'm using, um, I'm thinking about this sort of like, not necessarily disparity of wealth, but contrast of cultures and what's, what's identifiable to them. So intermixed with these decorative object, these decorative patterns that would normally be found on, let's say a Sev pot or Union porcelain pot. Um, I'm also intertwining um, graffiti and patterns from bandanas and um, in Jordan Air, Air Jordan patterns from sneakers and thinking about um, what does a pattern from the ghetto look like and how can I execute that on the spot. And so um, at the end of the day, it, it is a really different approach to everything that's in that sort of gallery space. Um, but I'm really proud of it because I think one of the things I think about um, is that a museum itself can be really intimidating to someone um, in looking at these priceless objects and artifacts. And you start to see places where in museums, people are able to find a bit of themselves in it um, or something that, that they can connect with. And then that becomes a bridge to opening them up to all sorts of things like, well, what is this pot referencing? Let me see the original of it. Why do people, um, you know, how does someone decorate a pot in this way? Why does it look like different than other pots? And how does it relate to the, the, the work around this? So people start asking questions that maybe normally you, you, you wouldn't necessarily ask because you didn't have a starting point, right? And so um, I love that my work in, um, and really the, the vision of, of and, and representative of my culture is here in the museum, you know, in the same city that, that I grew up in. Um, I almost, I got really teary eyed uh, for a second there when I saw the, the tapestries on the side because it, it really, uh, it really uh, pushed in the fact that this is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And I mean, it's as weird for me to see um, is anybody else imagining something that they made in this space? So imagine anything that you as makers have made being in that same exact space. That's how it feels to me. It feels really uh, odd, you know, like a, like a dream in, in some ways. Um, and it, you, you never really get over it. Uh, but one of the things I also love, the last thing I'll say, um, when I go to the museums is interacting with um, a lot of times the, the uh, docents and the security guards um, that work with the work because they often get to see people interact with it and their interpretation of what it is that I'm doing and their questions um, often uh, leave me asking questions about my own work and, um, and it gives me a lot of inspiration to go back to my own studio and think about um, how the things I'm making are affecting people. That's lovely. And I know we have several guides on the call. So uh, maybe towards the end, if, if uh, any of you have some questions or, or maybe anecdotes about how you're, um, how you notice people interacting, that would be fun. How long was this up before the close closure? It, it went up the, I want to say second or third week of February. So not too long. And so not too, not, not maybe a month it was up before we closed. <clears throat> and the plan was to, before COVID was to keep it up for a, a one year. Um, but I'm hoping that we can, you know, add the, the COVID quotient to the, yeah. <laughs> to the end and have it up, you know, for, for whatever period of time that we can have it as long as possible. Um, you know, yeah. I, I do know, I do know that, um, you know, as it was going in, the, the guards were intrigued and happy to see something, A, something changing in the galleries is always welcome by the guards. Um, 
one guard specifically asked me more about the object, uh, wanted to know more beyond the label, and he said to tell you, Roberto, you're a cool brother. That's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he hopes he, hopes he gets that. to meet you. Um, it gave him a lot of pride. It gave him a lot of pride. Make and it that, happen. Yeah, and that gave me a lot of pride to, you know, I, I've always said, and those who know me well, that as a curator, I feel like I have pixie dust in my pocket. And when I get to sprinkle it, this is like that moment. This is a, a moment of pixie dust. You know, like it's, I have that, that moment of, of, I hate to use the word power, but it is power and it's a privilege to use it in this way um, and bring your work forward and for everyone to see. Um, that was very powerful what you said earlier and I, I will always hold on to that. Um, but yeah, it'll be, I hope once we open, you all out there can come see it in the flesh. It's a really powerful installation. It was great, great to hear. Um, oh, Rob, were you saying something? Oh, I was just gonna say, I made such good friends with, uh, I had an installation at the Walters Museum a few years ago and I made such good friends. Oh, you're on mute again. I, I use them all for, um, uh, for uh, amuses for uh, teapots and I gave them all the teapots that I made of them so they all had something to take away from the museum uh, and that was that was a lot of fun that's wow. right. it's so nice um, well thanks all of you for talking about the installation and, and Rob for sharing that last bit of just the power of seeing your your work in the gallery it's um, it's just it's great to hear that and it is powerful as a visitor and it's it's really, I think when curators and, and artists get to work together, it's pretty special, especially for, um, I know those of us who, at, in my previous work, I was studying artists who uh, have been long dead and it's really exciting to be able to talk directly to someone um, about their work and how they feel about it. <clears throat> I, I love this picture of um, that Jack shared of Udon in his studio partially because he's working with clay, so that's great, right? And um, he's not, he is n not working directly from the subject here. So as Jack was saying, that idea that they're kind of working, um, you know, on their own. And the, um, that connection between making Benjamins, so he made plaster casts or had plaster casts made of his Benjamin Franklin bust, which was a way for him to make money. So he was literally, making Benjamins. <laughs> Benjamin, sorry. I like that. um, Turning him out. He basement. wasn't on the money back then though, right? No, I know, but it's still. It didn't, but it didn't take very long. Paying shekels. <laughs> <laughs> shekels, yeah. Um, so, and then that connection that um, Jack brought up also that Udon was a, an awardee of the Prix de Rome, you know, when he was, um, given that honor, which isn't exactly the same as the Rome Prize today, but it is um, certainly a connection. And that's uh, a nice opportunity for us to segue over and talk to Rob a little bit about his time in Rome, because he had that incredibly prestigious honor of being chosen to go there and spend some time. So first I thought, um, Rob, can you tell us about, was the project that you talked about doing in Rome, was that, um, did you have to apply Recreating with that Napoleon's project? Napoleon's dinner set. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how did you yeah, come up with I, I that idea? Have, what I, I did have to apply for it. Uh, one of my uh, associates at Tyler School of Art, Karen Olivier, was the recipient of it in 2018. And uh, I, I thought of the Rome Prize as being something um, that you don't necessarily apply for as a ceramic artist. Um, and uh, and I think that's that is probably the mentality I think of a lot of ceramic artists is that we apply for ceramic things, and you know we don't necessarily apply to things under the uh, visual arts. But um, the Rome Prize had a, a section called design, and so I applied for that. And um, it was a very uh, intimidating process. I mean, they fly you in and interview you for this, and I couldn't make it, so I did my interview at Starbucks, and uh, somebody 
was uh, trolling me at the same time <laughs> in the shop. So it, that was complicated. And, and when I when I first received it, I found out I received it. We were still unsure if we would be able to go because I have a, a wife and two kids. Um, and uh, you know, my wife then decided she was she was down to go, and we all went. And it was a fabulous uh, month. Uh, you know, the first couple of weeks, uh, I, I was getting getting used to it and doing a lot of sort of foot traveling. And then my project started to turn into something else. I was really inspired by Italian graffiti and looking at sort of the contrast between the stylistic differences between uh, Philadelphia and Italian graffiti, and then also seeing it on buildings that are several hundred years old. And, um, and all these contrasts just really changed uh, my perspective. And so I started to work with, um, with drawing out um, scenes in, in, in Rome. And um, probably about two weeks while we were there, we, we had to go into quarantine. And then uh, the last two weeks, I really didn't have access to my studio. But then we got a message saying we had to go. And we, we flew out the next day. And we had to, I had to leave all of my inventory. I'd made over 50 pots by that point, And I left all those pots in my my brushes and all my Italian, you know, paints that I was so excited about, you know, everything was left and it, it really felt like, um, it felt, uh, this might be an exaggeration, but it felt traumatic uh, to, to move and be a provider for my family and, um, you know, have to leave all these things. And, uh, you know, when we came back, we, we basically have been in five different houses. This is our fifth apartment since um, I had to leave because, I planned on being in Rome for six months and um, I'm hoping that I get to go back because that experience, um, you know, just to give you a sense of, of um, what it's like to be there. I mean, you, you wake up in an old palace and uh, you know, you, you walk over to the cafe and they make you whatever you want to drink, uh, espresso, macchiatos and, and all those things. And you sit down and um, you think about your day, your studios in that building, you overlook, I think we have a picture here of, of the view from my studio, which is this fountain with ducks swimming in it. That was my view. Of it. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I'd go right around the corner and, uh, you know, grab some fresh mozzarella and, um, and uh, you know, do all these wonderful Italian things that were really inspiring to me and my family and, and things that I didn't think, I didn't think my wife would be into Rome, but she's desperate to go back now. Um, as am I. And so we, I, I personally realized how important travel is to my work and, and um, how important it is to go to these places um, that my work is inspired by. Because, you know, um, if I think about European ceramics and uh, how it's played such a central role in, in what it is that I, um, I do as a maker, um, you know, the people who made those things originally were inspired by place and physically being in those places. And so for me to physically go to those places and then see the work in museums and collections, I think is, is going to play a huge role in, in me, uh, you know, bringing that back and in, in, um, in, in moving forward with my work. And it's so powerful to talk about place and that just directly connects to so many things that you are already thinking about, like the immigrant experience, um, the inserting people of color into the canon of history and art history that hasn't really been done well enough yet. Um, and when you travel, it, that's when all of us really can understand each other's culture better when you're going into, um, you know, another place and, and just even the small changes that exist between somewhere like Rome and Philadelphia. Um, and in so many ways, there are a lot of similarities, but once you start to see those little differences, I think it makes us um, aware of small cultural differences, even within our own country or our own cities. And I can also relate that to your idea about having your piece in the gallery um, at the museum. So it's, it's a way for, um, it's always that unexpected difference that wakes your mind up in a way to the perception of other differences and other um, ways of appreciating each other for our differences. So I, I, I think that that's um, really great. And I, do, I hope, I so strongly hope that you get to go back because I can't wait to see what kind of work uh, will eventually come out of that. Um, 
I, and, and the academy is is promised to, to ship me all of my work, you know, once once they can. So um, I'm I'm really grateful for them. They they did an excellent job under the circumstances. So yeah, can you talk just a little bit specifically about the project with regard to Napoleon's dinner service? I I read a little bit about it, and I was so interested to hear your idea connecting that immigrant experience with um, in France with what you saw as Napoleon's um, and intent for propaganda in a way kind of tying back to what jack was talking about for what udon yeah i mean uh, you know the really the the premise of the idea started around um the desire to have a a big uh, a big meal um and to invite people from different parts because the, the half of the project took place in in uh, france and half of the project took place in Philadelphia. And, and really, we were gonna have um, the same meal um, off the same dishes in, in both cities. Um, and uh, in Philadelphia, I had really planned on bringing people from um, across neighborhoods and cultures and, and um, different socioeconomic backgrounds to be able to share a meal. And very, and, and my hope was very little uh, agenda in terms of getting people to think differently, um, more about just, having people um, be a part of the experience. And then, um, you know, that happening enough, I think will will make a positive impact on culture and society. And so I really wanted to go and work. And when I was in Italy, I got to use the Limoges porcelain um, that I wanted to work with. And that porcelain is not fun at all to work with. It's basically like sculpting with cream cheese is, is the equivalent, it's, it's a paste and it doesn't want to do the things that normal clay wants to do. Um, but I, I really wanted to uh, um, also collaborate with the people that were at the American Academy. And so at the time, there was a, um, there was a, a scholar who was um, looking at um, uh, African Americans who had um, done a large, you know, really famous African Americans who had done projects in Rome and Italy or had lived there. Um, and sort of uh, building a connection between African Americans in, in, in Rome. And, um, you know, I just started that conversation about, you know, asking, uh, you know, can you tell me more about the people you're, you're studying and, and thinking about how to uh, render, you know, those people's stories onto these plates and dishes that I was making. <clears throat> and then doing the same thing in Philadelphia. But, uh, yeah, I think my, my, my plan uh, adapted. One of the things is, is, you know, when you're writing, you can be really ambitious. You can say, I'm going to have a, a table for 100 people um, in a street somewhere in Philadelphia. I mean, you can say, I'll have a table for 1,000 people. Um, but then when you start to put things together and realize what you're capable of, sometimes you can still have just as strong as an idea um, of an idea um, that you're you're actually physically capable of, of doing. And so that's what ended up happening with my plans was, as I started to go along, I said, well, is this important? Is this gonna do the thing that I wanted to do? And if, if not if there's an easier way, but there, if there's a more effective way to get the thing done, um, I think that's, that's the approach that I wanna have. Well, I just like to put out there that if the Clay Studio can help, we're here for you. And um, it ties so beautifully into the idea of our new building being built in, you know, in Kensington, um, which not to be putting too much of a plug in for us, but, you know, Rob, for those of you who don't know, is grew up in his early years in, in a different part of Kensington in that neighborhood. And we were really dedicated to connecting with the community, which Rob has already started helping us do and working with us. Um, so I feel like maybe helping you have that dinner uh, facilitated in some way could be a, a logical next step from making Potter American, Dale American Street. Park. Yes, in front of, right on America. <laughs> we just close the street down. We've done it before. <laughs> I think we had, Josie's on the call, I think we had at least 500 people at our clay fest um last year having dinner in dinner in a tent there so okay, we can make we it can happen it. <laughs> Jennifer it Martin giving us the lights. thumbs up <laughs> um well i think that that we are at one hour and that is such a lovely way to kind of wrap up the 
the formal part of the conversation, I'm still absolutely happy to um, check out the chat over here and ask if anyone, do, first, do any of you, the, the three of you, have any final words you want to share before we kind of go to a less formal conversation? Just to say thank you. That was really great to have all different yeah. aspects of looking at Roberto's work, having Jack um, speak to Houdon and make connections and, um, you know, really just hear from you, Roberto, about your and your reaction to the installation. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, and th yeah, thank I, you. Yeah, thanks to you three. I'd like to hear more from uh, from from Jack and Elizabeth. Maybe you can have a another session with just those two. I'd love to hear more about the goings on at the PMA. Right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just talk about ceramics. Yes. There you go. <laughs> None of the other goings on. Right. Um, okay, so let's go over to the chat. And we have someone. <laughs> Shelly wants to know when the trip to Korea is. Maybe, well, I'm sure Elizabeth is thinking about maybe leading a whole tour group to Korea at some point. <laughs> that, that, would that would be great. <laughs> um, so let's see. Other than Rome, Roberto, what other places have impacted your work, either domestic or international? That's Angela. Uh, I spent some time in Hungary. Um, a couple of summers there um, at the International Ceramic Studio, which they get to use this hair in porcelain. It's really translucent and um, also hard to work with, but um, well worth it. And um, being able to visit their factory and seeing the work that they're making and they're hand painting, every little thing that they do, and, and it's just, just really out of this world craftsmanship. Um, that was really um, inspiring to my work. And I would say working in community uh, studios, like uh, I got to be a resident artist at the Clay Studio for one summer. And uh, that was really influential to be there and have a lot of people asking questions and to see what people were and weren't impressed with, uh, you know, outside of school, uh, outside of people that are invested in you. So, uh, you know, that I think th those are probably the two places that um, bring me the most, most um, influence. Well, that's great to hear about Philadelphia, about the Clay Studio. I think, what did we decide? The Clay Studio was the first place in Philadelphia where you threw a pot? Yes, it was. It was pretty. It wasn't very good. <laughs> my, my <laughs> I'm sure it was great. And, and you said what people were and weren't impressed by. What were they not impressed by? <laughs> well, I remember I, I met this one woman and she was very nice. And she said, you know, uh, uh, you look so different than your pictures. You, you look, you, you're, you seem very happy in real life. And I was just unimpressed with what you look like. <laughs> Cause they, you know, always when they give me in a poster, I'm always like this, you know, or looking really uh, intimidating and serious. And, um, and then also, uh, you know, people would just walk by and just be like, I like this kind of spout instead of that one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you get enough of that stuff then you start to look at it, you go, I see why, you know, and uh, that was that was a really rewarding um, opportunity to have to kind of just be on view to everyone, every little part of your process you're doing. It could be a bit intimidating, but it it's also helps you work through a lot of things much quicker. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, um, no no filters there. But right. and and in the uh, not to keep saying in the new building, but in the new building, <laughs> we're gonna have. Um, a demo space right in the front window on the first floor. So any artist who wants to come over and do some work and have the, the idea is that the neighborhood can come by and just see physically right there what's happening inside the building. So that hopefully will inspire people. Um, you need to look for a house near there. <laughs> um, Let's see, Ray Raymond um, was is saying that Franklin was a self-made man. So that, you know, when you, I thought that too, Rob, when you were saying, you think of him as, as being this wealthy man, which he was, but as a kid, he actually had a really hard um, time uh, as a yeah. young person sort of growing up first in Boston. We, I know in Philadelphia, we don't often talk about the fact that he was born in Boston, but he had um, kind of a tough life. <laughs> And came here and really just pulled himself up by his bootstraps and did, you know, found his niche and, and did great. That sounds familiar to me. 
Um, other questions? Anyone want to take themselves off mute and say hi or ask a question is welcome to do that. We have a lot of thank yous and. Um, I probably have to head out pretty soon. Yeah. Oh, I know you have your other thing. Okay. Yeah, right. I'd like to share my, one of my prized possessions. Oh, oh my oh. goodness. That's a great one. Come and I just want to say how much of an inspiration you are to my students. I always show your NSICA talk. And, um, you know, I work in a community college. And a lot of my students, you know, come from really tough backgrounds. And you're such um, a symbol of being able to rise above you know, whatever disadvantages people have. So um, just really powerful work, very moving. Oh, thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. This I is my son, Theo. He wanted to say hi. He was, he was very excited to see one of my pots. I see you. <laughs> I see you. Um, yeah, anyone else out there want to say anything? You're welcome to do so. And otherwise we can, I'll just give you one more second before I sign off. Yeah. Roberto, I met you at Mural Arts. I just want to say how fly. Congrats on having this at the PMA. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about it. Roberto. I, why can I, what, I why can't all these people be my friends? They are <laughs> friends. <laughs> we are your friends. I want to ask a question. Hi, Roberto. Um, hi. Hi. I was wondering, do you do um, residencies, artistic residencies in schools? in public schools? Um, I could. I, 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 I haven't really uh, done any in schools. Um, I, know my, I know my students get tired of me using the kilns at school, so. <laughs> okay. Is well, there any way I can, yeah. can, can I give? My email um, is, sure, my email is robertolugostudio at gmail. Okay. All right, got we'll that. We'll talk. Thanks. I think, did um, Eloane, did you have a question? I'm sorry if I didn't say your name right. It's okay, it's uh, difficult, I guess. Um, yeah, my question is about your work. Uh, Roberto, I was wondering if you are interested in making like sculptural work as well. I know that your work already engages an audience to create conversations. Um, but I'm also wondering as if you'd ever think about making like sculptural, like interactive works. I'm just asking to because I am a ceramicist now, like I'm trying mm -hmm. to do this work um, right out of college and just wondering any advice on how to do that if you are interested. I don't know. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I have made some sculptural work. Um, mostly figurative uh and, and um i have a a big self-portrait um that i made of myself that's life-size it's actually made from a cast of my body and um the idea of that was that if it's freestanding um then you know it does interact people can interact with it i mean even without touching it sort of getting close to that is is uh, i think an experience um and then also building um a pot that's large enough for my whole body to fit in and so scale at some point uh, sort of makes it um, sculptural as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love working with all sorts of different mediums. Um, you know, um, I, I would say that uh, clay is just my go-to. I think it's, it's like, you know, your sketch pad. Everybody's got their sketch pad that they start at and mine's has always been clay. I think just instinctively it, it, it works out that way. Thank so you. I just shared, um, if you want to look in the chat, there's a link to Rob's work at the Wexler Gallery and you can see some of those larger pieces. I know you have to go, Rob, because you have another... Um, Hello? You have another thing coming up. So if you want to, we'll just say goodbye and thank you. And anyone who wants to hang around for a couple of minutes and just say hi and talk to each other, you're welcome to do that. But um, thank you so much, all three of you. I really appreciate your time and your just um, generosity to the Clay Studio. We, we're, we're so happy to be able to share the conversation with you today. Thank yeah, you thanks guys. Thanks for bringing us all together. No problem. Thanks. All right. See you soon. Bye. That's great. Bye. Thank you.
Thanks. Hi, Nadia. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Hi. I like watching everyone Watch the numbers go down around the stage. <laughs> that was fabulous. Yeah, that was really fun. Thanks. Hope you all had fun out there. I sure did. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, guys. You're Thanks, welcome. Judy. Bye. I think we had, we definitely had about 100. I looked around. Yeah. There were 90 like nine, At one point, I said 96. Yeah. Yeah. Like cool. Okay. Hi, Hello. Mom and Dad. Hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs> Oh, you're in, you're in the sewing room. Is that, ladies and Ray, I love you, I love your uh, coloring book. <laughs> oh yeah, Raymond put the, oh, I yeah, forgot to mention I tried, that, I'm sorry. I, I tried to, I pushed it to our media people and hope, because our pot is featured in there, so thank you. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right, I guess great. I'll end the meeting. Thank so, oh, thanks, no. thanks Francine. Okay, bye everybody. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. It'll be the highlight of the week, I can tell you. Oh, that's nice to hear. Thank you. Hi, Franz. Bye bye. Bye. How you doing, Franz? Oh, you're gone. Okay. Bye.